All right, we made it. Final recording of the semester. This is your final, your review for the final exam, uh, which will be on Monday morning. I believe I have it set only to be open for two hours. Check the time. It's on Canvas. The assignment's been there for a couple of months. Uh, make sure you're prepared. It's a little bit uh, different in terms of the time that you'll have available. As you know, so far this semester, we have had about two days, uh, in some cases a little bit more to complete an exam. Um, you'll have about the same amount of writing. Uh, there's one additional section that you will see on the final exam that I will explain uh, here in this review. Um, but you will not have the two or three days time. In fact, you will only have, I believe, a window of two hours from when the exam opens to when the exam closes. Um, it should be plenty of time for you to write three complete sentences for each of the three prompts that we've been practicing, refining, and building skills up until this point. Um, I've been giving you feedback uh, on every exam along the way. Um, there's definitely measurable improvement almost across the board. Um, so I have full confidence that you will do really well um, as long as you make an attempt. Um, there's, uh, it's going to be the same format. I see, I feel, and this is important to us in architecture because. And there's a fourth section that you're going to see on the final, which is going to ask you to explain in your own words and offer new insight, not repeat some of the things you've heard me talk about with respect to the projects in the lecture, um, and not necessarily the words of another architect, the architect perhaps, another architect describing the work in a critical format um, or an article that you've read somewhere else. I'm asking you really for the first time and the only time as you uh, move on from this course and continue your career in architectural studies uh, and hopefully even as architects beyond that, um, I'm asking you to begin to formulate your own opinion of what the architect is attempting to do or what the architecture is conveying or attempting to convey in your own words. Um, there was a lecture earlier in the semester where I described the notion of uh, talking about something that's not there. So looking and doing a close critical reading and describing something that's not evident. Um, think back to... Um, Think back to uh, Vitruvius um, and the notion of uh, firmitas, utilitas, and uh, ebenustas, uh, the notion of firmness, commodity, delight. Uh, and when we talk about firmness, we're not necessarily talking about the literal firmness of the material, but the firmness in what the architecture is conveying, the architecture um, with a... Uh, broad portico with uh, granite or stone columns uh, lifted up off of the ground um, get, conveys the notion of safety, of civic um, architecture. We see that kind of work because the Supreme Court of the United States is a really good example. Uh, yes, the building is firm. Yes, the building is standing up. But also, more importantly, the building looks like it's firm and like it's standing up. So this notion of um, what the affect is that the architect is after. Um, so I'm asking you to look for that, and that's really the fourth part um, of your final exam. The other thing I've done, uh, there's going to be a couple of housekeeping things, and then we'll get into the projects. The other thing that I've done is I've um, already posted on Canvas the vocabulary words which combine chapters 18, 19, and 20's vocabulary words um, I will also go over them uh, in this lecture here this evening uh, together with you, and I will actually look to point out 
um, in a project an example of that vocabulary word. Um, so that's available to you. We are going to go over today 16 including the so I did add one project so it was 16 I actually added one it's going to be 17 so we're going to look at 17 projects today of which when we move to the final you should expect to see four of these 17 projects so of the projects I'm going to go over and do another review today. None of them are new projects. Every single one of these projects you've seen in the lectures from the last three, three and a half weeks. So if you go back and watch the last four, if you go back and watch the last five lectures, you will see all of the buildings that I cover here today, but I will do another review, perhaps not as in depth as we do in the lectures. We spend a little bit more time on each project, uh, but I will definitely um, touch on the character defining features and why each of these projects are important. Um, it's not an easy thing to summarize uh, 120 years of architecture and perhaps one of the most productive periods of architecture um, in our modern history. Um, so I've applied a few rules because we've looked at probably over uh, 1,200 buildings uh, in the last four weeks alone, and the chapter is basically 18, 19, 20, or from the beginning of modernism into mid-century modernism, late modernism, post-modernism, and contemporary work, uh, deconstructivism and contemporary work. Um, we, we looked at over 115 or, or 20 projects uh, and there's no way that I could review 120 projects with you in one final review. And certainly it would be unfair to ask you to study all 120 buildings uh, of which um, four or five would be, uh, you'd be tested on in the final exam. So I've applied a few rules. Um, I've eliminated residential architecture, uh, Villa Savoie, uh, the Farnsworth house, the glass house, uh, even small um, non um non-public buildings um, such as the Barcelona, or I shouldn't say small, but uh, buildings that were not intended to be permanent buildings in the first place, uh, pavilions, uh, buildings for exhibitions, um, uh, those kinds of things I've eliminated out. So really what we're looking at are uh, public buildings, uh, churches, uh, commercial office buildings, um, and just buildings that we see in the cities that we live in and the cities that we visit, um, uh, museums, opera houses, um, uh, things that fall under the, the umbrella of uh, public buildings, publicly accessible buildings, and buildings built for consumption by the public. That's probably the more important point to make. Um, so in no ways... In no way am I attempting to, um, with this final review and really with the lectures from the past um, four weeks, am I uh, attempting to convey a comprehensive review of uh, modernism or the last 120 or 30 years of architectural design and production? Um, rather, I'm highlighting what, A, the book highlights as important projects, um, projects that uh, I've studied in my career as an architect, both as a student as well as as a professional architect, and projects that we uh, tend to refer to often. Um, so projects that come up, projects that have relevance uh, to work that we do today or to architects uh, practicing today who still kind of admire and uh, reference and look back at some of this work. Um, and also, I've tried to make sure and cover uh, really all of the more most prominent architects from the past 120, 130 years. Uh, so these are names that are going to continue to come up in your architectural education um, and as you move forward into your uh, into your careers. Um, so I just wanted to make that point that you know this I'm not attempting to cover uh, comprehensively. Um, there's probably some important buildings that I've left out. Um, as you complete this course and move on, 
Um, I welcome your feedback. I welcome you sharing with me uh, new buildings that you discover along the way that you think that I uh, maybe should cover and should include uh, or feel that I've left out. Um, I, uh, uh, I welcome that, that sort of feedback and that um, kind of building upon uh, the course so that over the years I can, with even more confidence, know that I'm um, teaching um, the proper basics of architectural history uh, to our students at Fresno City College. Um, oh, and there was one other housekeeping note before we get into our projects, uh, which is that, you know, the text that we've been using for the semester, it's a good text. It's a fantastic text. Keep it with you. Um, it will serve, uh, of, to be a very valuable tool to you as you continue your studies in architecture. Um, I've mentioned two other books. I want to actually recommend a third, and I will put uh, links probably to um, uh, these book titles, uh, maybe an Amazon link um, along with uh, this final review so that you can refer back to it later. Obviously, you know, these are not um, mandatory. These are just recommendations on good books that I have read. Uh, in some cases, I've read multiple times. Um, and I find to be very valuable uh, texts in, in understanding um, architects before us and uh, in creating some of the masterworks that they've created. Uh, so the first is the actual text of the course. You know that one. Um, this is a, uh, a really good book. Uh, it's called Modern. Both There's two books that are called Modern Architecture by different authors. This one is called Modern Architecture. Uh, it's by William Curtis, William J. R. Curtis, I believe, um, does a very good job uh, comprehensively covering architecture from 1900 to the date of publishing, which I think, think is about 20, 20, 25 years ago. Um, does a lot of really good diagramming um, and showing kind of proportional studies, even does some detail uh, drawings and some axonometric, some section cuts to really help you understand uh, beyond just photographs or floor plans, uh, the architecture uh, largely that we have covered in this semester. Uh, that's one. This one I've referred to in the past. It's Rudolf Wittkover, um, W-I-T-T-K-O-W-E-R. So it's spelled with a W, but pronounced Wittkover. Uh, this is a fantastic text. And Wittkover goes back, um, even though he gets into some contemporary work, um, he starts it with... Uh, Alberti um, and Brunelleschi and some of the early architects uh, that we studied in the beginning of this course. Um, but he gets into the principles of humanism. As, as you recall, we start with humanism in the very beginning of this course. And so what he does is he breaks down and provides um, both diagrammatic as well as mathematical analysis on what some of the greats were doing uh, at that time and the proportions that they were endeavoring to convey in their work. He does uh, like plan elevation comparative studies. He actually does plan elevation comparative studies side by side between projects and shows us that Corb with uh, Villa Savoy, for example, was effectively studying and mimicking um, Alberti's uh, Mantua building or whatever it is. Um, so it's actually a very, it, it does a very good job of going into kind of an, a higher level of depth of architectural um, uh, underpinnings of the design work. Um, harmony, proportion, uh, rhythm, formulas, and um, all kinds of really, really interesting things that give you a sense of what how the architecture, uh, how the architect created um, the work. So Vitkover is a very good text. The third, I don't have a copy of. I lend my books out often, and this is one that hasn't returned to me, so I'll have to replace it in my library. But it's also called Modern Architecture. It's by, um, the author is Vince Scully, Vincent Scully, who was a um, Yale architecture professor, is considered in many respects the sort of grandfather of um, architectural um, architectural teachers. Uh, he taught in the program at Yale for decades and also wrote a book called Modern Architecture, which is 
also a very good book. One of the first books I read when I started architecture school. And he does, uh, he basically covers in, I don't know, two or 300 pages, um, what we've covered over the last four weeks. So he starts, he basically starts just before modernism and explains kind of the undercurrents and what's happening in America and happening in Europe after the industrial revolution and how that led to this um, yearning to create something new. Uh, and that kind of put us on the, on the precipice of uh, modernism and modern architecture. And he takes it through uh, contemporary times. That book also is probably 25, was printed 25 or uh, so years ago. So that would take us to probably just after the turn of the uh, 21st century. Um, so those are three highly books that I highly recommend uh, you have in your library, you read at any time in the next couple of years as you advance your careers. Um, format on the final and let's jump in. Um, what I'll do first is a quick reading of the vocabulary words just to remind myself what the words are. And some of these are repeat from prior uh, prior sections, so the, they'll likely be familiar to you. Um, and then I'll try to point out um, each of these on some of the work that we look at. Uh, tripartite, uh, I think you know that one. Um, in fact, I've seen that word uh, come up in many of your essays and you're using it properly, so good job with that. Uh, tripartite, as you know, consisting of three parts in architecture, something that can be used to reference the composition in elevation or in plan. Some of you are even reading tripartite like across a site. I think somebody wrote about Seagram, uh, the site plan of Seagram being a tripartite composition. I think it was street, podium level, um, and then the building itself, which is is, is valid and, and interesting for sure. Um, PLOT, uh, I think we know that. Uh, Villa Savoie is, is probably the best example of this, but the slender uh, columns that support the upper mass. Uh, thin piers really is what it is. Thin pier, column, pillar, or stilts that lifts a building above the ground or water. Um, actually, the next four are all Corb's five points. The ribbon window, as we know, is the long horizontal strip window, continuous band uh, across the facade of a building, also known as a strip window. Free plan is the notion of, and you'll see it um, uh, probably best in um, Lever House, uh, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, Gordon Bunshaft. I know I said I wasn't going to say the names, but honestly, I don't care it, whether it's not important to me that you know the names of the buildings. It's more important to me that you know why those buildings are important and what the architects were doing. So I'm kind of relaxing that uh, that rule that I've uh, held in the past uh, of on the final review, I usually don't say the name of the building because I rely on your research, but uh, it, it's it's not important to me that you'd necessarily memorize the name of the building, rather know why it's important. Uh, so free plan, um, uh, Lever House is a good example of free plan, uh, and so is uh, Seagram Tower. The notion that the column is actually inboard of the exterior skin of the building, which actually allows the um, the walls on the inside as well as the walls on the outside to really do as the architect wishes because they are no longer having the responsibility of carrying the vertical load of the building. Um, program, uh, this has shown up in the past, the functions and requirements of a building or a space often provided by the client as intended core as the intended core use of the building. So the program is essentially the function of the building. Uh, is it an office building? Is it a church? If it's a church, does it have uh, a sanctuary space and a cry room and a narthex and a baptismal area um, and a pulpit? Um, it's basically the spatial requirements that a client uh, will oftentimes state. In other cases, the architect has to kind of uh, speak to and understand and vet out from the client what the, those programmatic requirements are. Um, the, uh, the site can be considered a program element uh, performative aspects can be a programmatic element, like at Vegas Factory, uh, the notion of having to arrange everything in a kind of a linear format so that the shoe last production process can actually be um, carried out in its most efficient state in that German industrial building um, would have been a program requirement that Gropius would have had to um, honor in whatever design um, ideas that he came up with. 
So program are basically the requirements of a building. Um, mullion, a uh, non-structural vertical strip between the casements or panes of a window. Uh, spandrel, uh, precast concrete will cover, cast in place concrete, rebar or reinforcing bar, uh, I'll cover that. Scaffolding, uh, we've talked about as early as Brunelleschi at uh, Santa Maria del Fiore, the notion of basically building um, uh, a ladder system, a temporary ladder system, either on the inside, outside of a building um, in, in early Renaissance work. That's how they we built a lot of the magnificent domes that we studied by basically building scaffolding on the inside. That's what makes Brunelleschi's uh, Santa Maria del Fiore so... Um, so earth shattering is that he was able to envision the, the construct envision and carry out the construction of that dome without having to set scaffolding on the inside, if you remember. So scaffolding is the, um, the bridging system or the ladder system that's, um, almost always, uh, temporary and is only serving its purpose for during construction. Uh, split pediments, think uh, Alberti um, and, and the notion of kind of breaking the pediment or taking that kind of frontal piece of a building and, uh, and splitting it, whether it's broken with a, a three-quarter round on top or whether it's literally separated from one another. Um, that's the split pediment idea. Terrace, I will cover. Uh, Lever House is a good place to talk about terrace. Diffuse Light we'll talk about with Khan and the Kimball Art Gallery. Uh, Brutalist Concrete we've talked about. You saw a lot of the work. Um, I don't have it in today's slides, but um, the one that comes to mind most prominently is uh, Corb's um, uh, Unité, the Habitation, um, the, uh, the roof element, and actually the entire building is... Um, unfinished, rough, raw concrete. Um, let me make a mark by the ones I've covered. Ribbon window, free plan, program, mullion, scaffolding we covered, brutalist. Round plan, um, I'll hold and I'll actually use an example coming up on that. Uh, Corb's five points, which we covered a few of them already. Uh, diagrid, this is a good one. And I, I wish I had done these vocabulary terms before the, the, the final lecture that I had um, given. But if you'll remember, we, I showed two foster projects. One of them was the, uh, the Swiss Ray or the St. Mary's Axe uh, building, with, which has the uh, spiral um, uh, exhaust system, the, um, the air circulation system on the outside of the building that basically travels in the helical form uh, in the facade. So the facade performs um, as uh, part of the mechanical system of the building. Well, the structure that you're seeing on the outside, that pattern, that diamond pattern that the uh, structure creates um, as it uh, winds up the building, that's a diagrid. Um, uh, that would be considered a diagrid um, mullion system in that case. Um, another good one is the Seattle Public Library. REMS Seattle Public Library uses a diagrid um, system on the outside, of basically a, um, a glazing system, a diagrid glazing system on the outside, which also has structural uh, performance. So I suppose you could consider it a curtain wall because it has, <coughs> <coughs> pardon me, because it has um, uh, structural function. Uh, so the definition, proper definition that I have here is diagrid is a framework of diagonally intersecting metal, concrete, or wooden beams that is used in the construction of buildings and roofs. Um, it requires less structural steel than a conventional steel frame. We talked a little bit about Buckminster Fuller, but that's, I think, one of the things that Foster likes so much about Bucky's ideas is that um, in things like the geodesic dome and in adopting the diagrid system, um, I think he's convinced, and I have no reason to doubt that this is true, that the use of a diagrid system actually results in less material being necessary. It's more complicated to fabricate and construct, but in the end, if you're doing massive, massive buildings uh, and the tonnage of metal or steel that you're using makes a difference in terms of the cost, then um, I can see how the diagrid system actually comes into play as actually really a cost-saving um, technique 
uh, that Foster um, uses quite a bit and actually Rem uses it on uh, lots of buildings. Look up uh, the CCTV tower if you're interested. <clears throat> okay, so that's diagrid. Uh, hot rolled and cold rolled steel I'll cover. Curtain wall we've certainly covered. Nauseam, uh, but that's the thin, usually aluminum framed wall containing infills of glass, metal panels, or thin stone. Framing is attached to the building structure and does not carry the floor or roof loads of the building. It's basically the system that hangs on the outside. It could be floor to floor or it could hang multiple stories, but effectively all it's doing is it's supporting itself. It's not taking any additional load bearing um, responsibility from the rest of the building uh, because really the columns inboard are doing that. Tapered, uh, you know what tapered is. Thickness increases with depth for achieving greatness, great greater strength capacity. Um, tapered, you know, kind of inverted tapered <clears throat> is really we use it to describe uh, the form of a building. Uh, again, the Seattle Public Library has the uh, tapered uh, upper section on the front facade. <clears throat> Planar surface uh, cover, uh, we did ribbon window already. The liberated facade, another one of the five points, uh, is the notion of separating the exterior of the building from its structural function, sets the facade free, for, free from any structural constraints. We've covered that. Uh, clear span, uh, Pompidou Center is a really good example of this. Uh, clear span is an architectural term to describe the distance between two inside surfaces of the spans and supports, the distance that is uninterrupted by vertical columns or supports. So often when you have these long uh, span areas and you need to free span that area, which means the preference is maybe the program requirement is that we don't have uh, interrupting columns. Um, oftentimes we'll build trusses, sometimes we'll build space frames. Pompidou Center, again, is a really good example of how we achieve that free span. And by the way, the term that um, I don't think I remembered, I was trying to remember, of the element that Rogers and Piano have added on the Pompidou Center, which we'll look at here in a moment, um, that, ex that allows them to um, uh, create a, a slightly longer free span than would have been ordinarily possible by putting those kind of armature extensions on the outside of the buildings that I showed. I even showed you a diagram of how they're handling uh, the distance between tension and compression. Those things are called gerberets. I had forgotten the name and I think, yeah, that's actually right here on your vocabulary term. Um, so down from clear span, uh, which we're uh, finishing here, two down from clear span are gerberets, the term gerberets. I think it's a French term. Uh, but let me finish with, with clear span, an architectural term to describe the distance between two inside surfaces of the span supports the distance that is uninterrupted by vertical columns or supports. That is a clear span. Okay, so you got that. Um, a truss, oftentimes is used to create a clear span, is a structural element that consists of members that are organized in connected triangles so that the overall assembly behaves as a single object. Tension, compression, the diagonals in between, the webs as we call them, um, those three kind of things together, the top cord, the bottom cord, and the web diagonal web members together create a truss which allows um, longer spans. Okay, so that's truss. Uh, Gerberet is a mobile cantilever system intended to ensure the overall stability of a structure by establishing a junction between a post and a beam. Again, Pompidou Center is a really good example of the Gerberets. Uh, okay, and the Bilbao effect we'll talk about, uh, and opaque I will cover as we look at the work. Okay, jumping in. Let's see, starting with, uh, so these are all in, these are in chronological order. Um, you should know the building by sight at this point. This is uh, AEG Turbine Hall. Um, this is Peter Behrens, as you know, Peter Behrens, uh, lived 1868 to 1940 and Peter Behrens gives us turbine hall in 1909 in Berlin, Germany. Character defining features of turbine hall. Another really good example of free span. So this is a 
uh, industrial building where they are producing uh, engine turbines or turbines for engines. Um, and so they need free span, clear, high volume, open areas in which the machinery needs to be arranged and things are being picked up and moved overhead, which are very heavy. Um, and so there's, there are armatures and devices that basically are spanning sometimes from one side to the other and other times are having to actually uh, be used to kind of pivot over some of the production happening below. So we can't have a uh, 12 steel at 12 feet and, and say, okay, you have the space below that finished ceiling or below that framing um, for the um, uh, industrial plant to function. So Barron's had to come up with a tall, free span space. He obviously chose steel for that solution. In doing so, he decides that um, because the building is using steel and because steel is not necessarily a common material to use uh, at this time, it is new and is considered progressive and more forward thinking. Um, he decides, I'm going to show that off. I'm going to express the structure on the outside. And actually, he deliberately not only tapers the glass to give the structure a more articulated quality, but he also pulls it back in plane in section in relation to the outside of the steel. Certainly, he could have done the opposite. He actually could have put the curtain system or the glass on the outside which would have put the steel either immediately behind or he could have even put it considerably behind. Um, he doesn't do that deliberately because his intent is to basically show off what the main purpose of the building is, which is to have an industrial function, which is made possible by the use of steel. So I'm going to celebrate the steel, damn it, is what Barons is telling us. Uh, opaque was another one of your terms. So reading the corners of turbine hall uh, tells us uh, or reveals to us that Barron's is using an opaque quality uh, in contrast with the transparent quality. So the glass would be transparent. The brick is obviously opaque. We can't see through. So he's basically taking the corners away, uh, taking the transparency away from the corners and actually treating them as opaque surfaces. There's a real good view of the free span, high volume open areas. Also very uncommon. I guess the, the, the relevance I should have pointed out with respect to the glass, uh, both along the side, but more importantly on the, uh, on the gable end is think back to your history class about um, suffrage and the industrial revolution and the working conditions that so many workers across Europe and even in the United States and in the United Kingdom were revolting against in this time period. And now in your mind, think about does this space feel in terms of its quality, anything like those spaces. I mean, he is flooding the space with natural light, even bringing light in from above. It's the exact opposite of the dark, uh, smoky, soot-filled rooms that were so common in the industrial age. Um, Barron's is doing something completely different and actually making it kind of a refreshing and inspiring space to be in qualitatively. <laughs> Uh, there's a good view of one of the bays. Bay has been uh, a vocabulary term we've had in the past, but you know that's one section of the building is a bay. Uh, so there's kind of an elevation view. Again, he's clearly showing off the kind of industrial nature, the riveting um, of the, the manufacturing and the assembly of the steel um, is not being concealed, is not being hidden. He's celebrating... Um, the industrial quality of the building. Um, okay, so that's Turbine Hall, which is a really good point counterpoint with um, actually one of his mentees, uh, which is Walter Gropius, another um, luminary architect. I don't want to say a luminary German architect because he's a luminary world architect, but he was German. Um, he does Vegas factory in Alfeld, Germany. Um, uh, Gropius lived 1883 to 1969. 
and he does Vegas Factory uh, a mere two years after his mentor, Peter Behrens, does the Turbine Hall. Um, Gropius is basically refuting everything Behrens did at Turbine Hall. If you remember the opaque corner, Gropius is saying, I want the corner to be transparent. And he's actually giving us glass on the corner to show off or to convey or to drive home the point that not only is the is there a, a wrapping ribbon window or is there's a wrapping corner window, but actually I'm doing that to show you that the structural load bearing function of this building does not even occur at the corner, which is uncommon because for hundreds, if not thousands of years up until this point, corners are considered the weak point of a structure and we would always place a column or a support there. Well, in the industrial age, Gropius is doing kind of what Corb is going to do a few years later with Villa Savoie, which is to show off the notion that the facade is actually now uh, free to do what it wants and doesn't actually have to have a load bearing capacity in all of its surfaces, if any. So he's doing the opposite with respect to the corner. Um, he's also doing the opposite with respect to structure. It's a little bit more subtle with Gropius, but you can see where the masonry piers occur between the glass transparent sections. And where Barons is pulling them out, Gropius is actually pushing them back. And he's really celebrating the glass, the contemporary, the window, the transparent uh, part of the building. He's basically treating hierarchically um, on the outside. Uh, he actually takes very good care of what I've always admired about this is the banding and how the mullions line up with the, uh, with the expansion joints between the masonry walls. But you can see that kind of telegraphs through. And I think what that helps with is having the building kind of read as one uniform element because these kind of horizontal lines track all the way, uh, all the way through the facade. Um, and the building is an expression of the function that takes place on the inside. It's a shoe last factory. And what you're looking at here is basically the shoe last production process with an envelope uh, wrapped around it. Um, okay, that's Vegas. Uh, third, Lever House. We've talked about this. We've talked about all of these at length, but Lever House is done by the architectural firm Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Uh, the architect most closely associated with uh, Lever House is Gordon Bunshaft. Um, he does this building in 1952. This is in New York City. Um, and this is really the uh, one of the main reasons this building is um, studied in architecture and is groundbreaking uh, and is actually a landmark, both a city of New York landmark as well as a National Parks Service landmark, um, is this is where the curtain wall was invented. So the modern tower that we have, yeah, that yeah, has become almost ubiquitous, even in this picture, as you see in New York all around us, uh, the notion of the curtain wall was really invented uh, here with Lever House, which you can see with respect to where the columns are in relation to the exterior facade. You see it probably a little bit better here. The columns are pulled back, the curtain or the glass on the outside, the mullions, the fins are uh, really just supporting themselves and they're um, liberated, if you will, from the load bearing element, which is the column behind. Uh, the other couple, two other things with respect to Lever House. Well, one other thing I should say is um, giving the users of the building a removed from the busy New York street grid open space. So by putting this garden on the roof of the second floor, because really the first floor is the ground plane. Then you have a second floor of some offices. Uh, and then you have this garden on top, which um, another one of the vocabulary words was terrace. Uh, 
which is a relatively small semi-outdoor area adjoining a building's porch or promenade, sometime the roof, often paved or a planted area. This is a really good example of a roof terrace. Um, it's obviously not a roof terrace on top of the... Um, I want to get the number of stories right for Lever House. Uh, 24 stories on the tower. Uh, another important character defining element is the contrast or the juxtaposition of the tall, thin, horizontal quality of the office tower juxtaposed against the, uh, sorry, did I say horizontal? The tall, uh, vertical quality of the office tower juxtaposed against the low, horizontal quality of the base level. Uh, which, um, as we talked about, has the roof terrace on top of. Uh, and then also the, um, the space below, which allows people to actually pass through, is um, also a unique thing in that there's this, I don't know, 200,000 square foot. Let's see if I have the square footage here. Uh, 289,000 square foot of building in the middle of the city of Manhattan, one would assume that this is a monolithic thing set on the ground plane, but actually by lifting the building up on Pilo T, um, we're, it's a little bit counterintuitive in that this very large building actually has open space um, at the ground level. <clears throat> okay, so there, there's a really good example of the vertical um contrasted or juxtaposed against the horizontal. The other thing uh, Skidmore Owings and Merrill did here is with the curtain wall system, they knew they had to develop a system to actually maintain the glass and keep the glass clean. So they developed a kind of a, a, a gondola and a stanchion system on the roof that would allow um, window washers and, and the servicing, the people servicing the facade to basically tie off and actually incrementally move themselves up and down with more ease than the afterthought that usually was how window washers um, cleaned buildings and cleaned glass up until taller buildings up until this point in large cities like New York. So they kind of thought through the technology there. Um, Yale Art Gallery, Lucan, uh, 1952, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, get there in my notes. Okay, I'm sorry, Yale Art Gallery, 1953. Uh, Lucan, as you already know, 1901 to 1974. Um, Khan is giving Yale University a state-of-the-art art and architecture gallery and studio building. Uh, one of the more interesting things about this project is that the program, the requirement that Khan is given here, is that the spaces should allow for flexible use oftentimes in a day, meaning that it should be uh, serve a function of hosting a lecture or allowing art students to do their artwork or architecture students to be doing their studio work during the day, but at night serve uh, for a gallery exhibition or for uh, some sort of a museum function. So Khan develops this sort of pinion system where the walls actually rotate to create um, studio spaces when needed and to open up to allow for curation of art and sculpture in a gallery format. He does that by developing. So the other thing you're seeing here is a free span uh, so this is not out of the ordinary in terms of the length, but by doing this uh, tetrahedron um, system, which Khan develops shortly after he does a trip to Egypt. And so um, what writers talk about with respect to what Khan is doing here is he's, um, and this is his first kind of major commission that really launches his career, but he's um, inspired by uh, the sort of remarkable um, architecture historical architecture that he just uh, explored and saw and his sketchbook is filled with, you know, sketches and um, uh, characterizations of the pyramids. It's something he's clearly interested in at this time frame. 
uh, he, and he seems to be integrating that into his work and developing this kind of innovative way of paying homage to, uh, to the um, pyramids of Egypt. And he develops this tetrahedron system, which allows them to thicken the, uh, by thickening the floor and using concrete, uh, and then again, using a diagrid system like Foster is doing, which is also one of your vocabulary words, Khan is able to actually achieve longer and deeper spans and reduce the number of columns in between, which is helpful given the program to have flexible and reconfigurable space on the inside. Uh, the stairwell, uh, use of kind of brutalist concrete. I mean, it is what it is. The concrete gets cast in this case it's cast in place another one of your vocabulary terms concrete for which scaff um, formwork is built concrete is poured in meaning it is cast in place it's cast here on the site as opposed to precast concrete which is cast in a plant in a more controlled setting and is delivered and assembled uh, on the site so here Khan is using cast in place concrete, stripping the forms, and that's it. There is nothing else happening to these concrete walls. This is the definition of brutalist architecture, beton brut. That's the stair landing that you're looking up in this stair shaft, this otherwise cold space where he's used this kind of rough concrete material. He uh, brings natural light into this space, which gives it a complete opposite quality uh, had he not brought any natural light into this space, it would otherwise feel cavernous. It would feel cold. It would feel perhaps even a little bit intimidating. The scale of it is quite large for a uh, stair, uh, stair shaft. Um, but the master of light, as we call him, Khan, by bringing natural light into this space is able to really change the quality of that space drastically. This is the space that we're looking up in there. Uh, and these are the kind of uh, large open spaces that we looked at a couple of photos in, in the very beginning. And then this is a section through the tetrahedron um, floor ceiling system. So this is the kind of the diagrid or the tetrahedron that you're looking at. One, two, three, four, five floors with the same floor system spanning in between, allowing us to achieve the longer and deeper spans. So that's the Yale Art Gallery. Um, Ronchamp, uh, 1954, uh, Corbusier, uh, in Ronchamp, France, um, Corb lived 1887 to 1965. Some of the character defining features of Ronchamp are the organic form of the building, the very expressive organic form of the building, the sort of curving um, uh, pillow shaped concrete forms, not easily achievable and certainly not something that there isn't a lot of precedent for um, up until this point. So he's using uh, concrete, which concrete itself was commonly used already, but he's giving us and inventing new forms and shapes using uh, concrete, which is actually quite interesting. Uh, the thickened walls we've talked about at Ronchamp are a character defining feature. Uh, they are tapered, another one of your vocabulary terms, uh, meaning they're thinner on top, they're deeper on the bottom. They allow for these light wells to have these very interesting quality. He even tapers, uh, he, he plays with tapering the four planes of the window openings, the niches um, fairly regularly. So sometimes it's the vertical jam that's tapered. Sometimes it's the head that's tapered. Sometimes it's the sill that's uh, tapered. And you can see the kind of variation uh, that he plays with here, which changes the light quality, but also the size of the opening uh, changes the light quality. The other thing I always like to point out that I uh, am interested that Corb is doing at Ronchamp is yes, he's building these very heavy, thick, tapered monolithic walls and punching them through with these beautiful window openings. 
but he's actually not taking that heavy solid mass all the way up to the roof to basically show off to us or to convey to us the idea that, yes, there's this heavy wall, but this heavy wall is actually playing a theatrical role in the architecture and is not necessarily serving a structural function. The structural function is handled by these four pilotes, these four thin slender columns in the wall that's taking the structure. And so I'm able to actually, I, he, Corb being the person speaking, I guess in first person, I'm able to separate the roof from the wall and allow even more natural light to come in just to remind you that actually the wall itself does not have structural function. It's really just the p portions that are opaque in that sliver where the structure is um, not able to be compromised. Uh, he's also being quite inventive in plan. So we have the one, two, three indoor chapels. There's the main sanctuary space and the kind of organic forms that he's playing with to create the plan volumes and extending the roof out as you see in, in this photograph. So this kind of overhang is really creating the fourth chapel, which is an outdoor chapel that's defined by the exterior walls and the projection of this wing wall to catch the uh, overhang uh, of the roof at this point, which was certainly needed for structural purposes because you have a deep cantilever here, you have a deep cantilever here. So ultimately you have a deep, dual can double cantilever happening at this point. And so some structural support there was necessary. Um, obviously Corb wasn't going to accept putting a column there. And so he continues that thick wall that we were looking at uh, in the earlier photo onto the outside to actually serve that bearing function there. But in doing so, creates this beautiful um, outdoor chapel. Uh, there's a nice interior view looking perpendicular towards that thickened wall. Um, okay, Seagram Tower, 1958. This is Mies van der Rohe. Mies lived from 1886 to 1959. This is in New York City um, in Manhattan, not far from Lieber House, in fact. Um, and Mies at Seagram is really giving America the first sleek um, contemporary, um, office tower. Uh, SOM was doing some interesting things for sure and being inventive with new materials, but this is kind of a take on making the office tower elegant. I don't believe Skidmore, Owings and Merrill was trying to make the office tower, uh, the, the skyscraper, if you will, an elegant form, whereas Mies is in almost a classical way, and we'll talk about some of the classical elements that Mies weaves in here, um, is, is trying to uh, solve the problem and give us a sort of modern elegance, if you will. Character defining features of Seagram Tower. The, uh, like Barons, who is expressing the structure and actually, you know, Gropius being uh, German himself, uh, knows Barons very well and has studied Barons as well as uh, Gropius, uh, who in large parts um, helped uh, Mies in his career. Uh, he appointed him to be the director of the Bauhaus after Gropius stepped down in that position. So Gropius uh, is not only somebody that Mies knows of and has studied his work, but actually they even have uh, direct interaction with one another. Uh, and both Barons and Gropius, as we know, were big on celebrating structure. Uh, uh, Barons to a high degree, Gropius in a slightly more subtle way, but Mies, kind of being a protege of, of the two of them, is no different. And so what he's doing on the tower here is he's basically cladding on the outside um, a steel or a, a bronze eye beam that's really just an ornamental element that is a commonly thought of as a structural element. We see an eye beam, we think structure. That's what the eye beam is invented to do. Um, and Mies is basically cladding it on this building and doesn't even provide a support 
uh, beyond the uh, ceiling of the first level to basically drive home the point that, hey, this is actually, yes, it's steel, but it's not actually serving a structural property. It just looks like it's serving a structural property um, or a structural role. Uh, and by doing so, he's basically expressing the verticality. So he's making, I believe, what looks like a tall tower look even taller by emphasizing the vertical lines. If you've done the extra credit assignment, uh, Louis Sullivan does this really, really well at the Wainwright building by pulling the facade forward, the vertical elements of the facade forward, pushing the glass back, and then actually pushing the horizontal bands back behind the structure gives it that effect of accentuating the verticality. So uh, Mies is doing that uh, very successfully here. Uh, the continuation of the same finish on the underside of the ceiling is always something I like to point out with Seagram. And here Mies is doing a lot of what he's doing at the Barcelona Pavilion, which is he's blurring the boundary between interior and exterior. You could be on the inside looking outside, uh, looking at basically the continuation of, first of all, the same plane, second of all, the same material to sort of play the game with you of you're not sure whether you're outside or you're inside and, you know, maybe you're both at the same time. Uh, and then I would say third and final and actually one of the more important things is he's he's held back the building considerably from the street grid where you see in the sort of real estate um, methodology of building in New York City then as well as now is maximize the footprint. You have a piece of land, build as much as you can possible on this land. Well, he convinces uh, the Seagram company to actually build a taller tower to satisfy the program requirements, but does so really in the service of providing um, uh, providing the building some breathing room against the street grid. And this becomes one of the most celebrated parts of the building is actually not the building itself, but the plaza space that's slightly removed from the street grid. I think it's like four or five risers up. Allows you to kind of pull away from the busyness, uh, have this kind of secondary zone as you transition into the building. Um, this was another one that I think somebody described. Somebody used the term tripartite to, to describe this procession from street to podium level to inside the building or taking the elevator up. I thought that was a really interesting um, reading. Uh, highly, highly kind of restrained discipline, very disciplined, sort of German discipline uh, in terms of the structural grid system. You see it here. This is the courtyard we were just looking at. These are the two reflecting ponds on, on either side. Uh, and then the tower in the rear basically follows the same grid system that the main tower in the foreground uh, follows. So that's the buildings in the back and the building in the middle, if you will, follows the same structural. They both follow the same structural system. Um, okay, the Guggenheim Museum, uh, also in New York. Um, this is by Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright lived 1867 to 1959. And Wright uh, builds, uh, he actually passes away, I think the year or year before the building is completed. The building is completed in 1959. Um, and some of the character, to, and it's a museum, some of the character defining features, uh, you know what, I should make sure that I cover program on all of them, uh, corporate office tower for the Seagram company, the alcohol company, um, uh, church, Ronchamp, art gallery, uh, architecture studio, art studio and art gallery for Yale university. Uh, corporate office building for the Lever Company, which is a soap company. Uh, shoe last factory. So they make the basically the wooden lasts that shoe makers use to basically stitch the leather shoe around. Like it's basically the form that allows somebody to make uh, the, the form that's used in the process of making the shoes. So this is a Fagus factory makes shoe lasts uh, out of wood. So industrial, industrial um, plant uh, and Fagus factory, same thing, industrial plant, uh, in this case, uh, turbine hall, I'm sorry, not Fagus factory, turbine hall.
Uh, same thing, industrial turbine engines. <coughs> Character defining elements of Guggenheim, Guggenheim, New York. Wright comes up with the idea of viewing art no longer by traveling in a linear fashion or in a linear serpentine fashion through a rectangular, very horizontal building. Um, he's given this site in New York, which is not the biggest site in the world. So he doesn't, you know, for starters, doesn't have, oftentimes in architecture, the constraint brings about the creativity. So um, not having the luxury of having a really long site, but having the luxury of serving a museum that has a lot of art to curate and to display Wright comes up with the idea of a visitor entering the museum, getting in the elevator, taking the elevator to the top floor, and actually winding, uh, walking around the building in this continuous, linear uh, ring format to get from the sixth level or the seventh level down back to the ground without actually ever feeling like you're moving down from a level to a level because yes, there's a slope and yes, you can read the slope mainly by looking out into the central atrium space. Um, but you don't get the feel that you're actually moving from one level to the other because you're never actually stepping on a riser. You're never climbing down a set of stairs and you're never on like a one to 20 or a one to 12 uh, ramp. It's a much more delicate slope. Uh, winding your way around the building. So you basically take the elevator to the top and you uh, move through the building around uh, to get back down to the bottom to see the artwork, which as you're circulating, you will see to your left or to your right. Well, to your you'll see to your left as you're uh, coming down. <clears throat> so you enter through here. It's the reception desk. You take the elevator, I think this was the elevator shaft, take the elevator to the top and you basically wind your way down into the, uh, down back onto the ground floor. Uh, the atrium and the light that fills the atrium, that's actually was why I had included this slide because he, like Khan, is flooding the space with natural light from above, which gives it a very interesting quality. Um, so light uh the the the, cir the method of circulation which is a very inventive way to solve the problem um and then actually the expression of the building on the outside has a very distinct uh quality that um has in in many ways uh become a symbol for uh if not new york this part of uh new york facing central park Okay, um, Kimball Art Gallery, or the Kimball Art Museum, I should say, 1972, Fort Worth, Texas, Lucan, uh, 1901 to 1974, lived Lucan, um, a master of light at work yet again, actually giving us something that looks like it could be from classical antiquity or from the ancients. I would say there is even reference to like the Basilica Barrel Vault, if you will or the barrel vaulted basilica. What Khan is doing here is in a museum which would appreciate having natural light for its quality, usually does not want natural light because of the ultraviolet effects on the artwork uh, and damaging the, uh, the prized possessions of the museum. So what Khan does is he figure out, figures out a way through an oculus at the top of the barrel to bring natural light down through, develops this armature at the uh, ridge of the barrel, which has perforated aluminum or steel. I'm not sure if this is steel or aluminum. I know it's metallic and I know it's perforated, uh, which basically allows the light to kind of diffuse and not be direct through down into the gallery spaces which all of this is aided and enhanced by the fact that it is also refract refracting light or reflecting some of the light that's coming down onto these perforated shrouds, 
back onto the underside of the ceiling. Oh, and the ceiling happens to be barrel shaped so that actually anything that's reflected back onto it actually also uh, diffuses down into the space, creating this very, very unique uh, interior quality, highly luminous interior quality. And he also keeps that um, uh, uh, concrete, um, he doesn't paint the concrete or doesn't apply any sort of a darker finish or a wood to it, which actually allows it to um, reflect the light down into the space even more so. Uh, travertine, another kind of a classical reference, uh, used vertically, wraps that also onto the ground plane. Um, and uh, you get a sense of the, the double barrel vault space here and the light quality that he's able to achieve here at Kimball Art Gallery. There's a really, really good shot of that uh, central ridge uh, armature. Also uses it to attach the track lighting. Okay, uh, Sydney Opera House, 1973, Sydney, Australia, Jorn Utzen. Um, the Sydney commission that uh, asks uh, that launches the competition basically tells architects propose a design uh, to satisfy the program requirements for the opera house and for the theater but also propose a design that's going to put Sydney on the map so Utsun develops this highly highly imaginative uh, double shell construction to look like the sails um on Sydney Harbor or juxtaposed against Sydney Harbor, uh, then proceeds to spend the next 20 or so years uh, developing the kind of techniques, the methodology, the construction details. Uh, becomes a very difficult project to complete, mainly because it's a highly imaginative and very inventive, innovative uh, form and building type that Otsun creates. But um, ultimately, it gets built and has become a world landmark. Um, the concrete shell or the, pre the precast um, elements that um, help Utsun develop the um, cladding system and the forms of the opera house are one of the key, key elements um, that allow this masterwork to be built. Uh, the interior quality is also, I would say, a character-defining feature, almost is the character-defining feature of any opera house or theater. Um, but, you know, his use of wood, especially juxtaposed against this very kind of white, uh, reflective um, concrete and tile exterior surface, has this very, very refreshing juxtaposition where he's using a high, high amount of uh, wood, a more natural, a more warm material, uh, on the inside. So this transition of outside to inside um, is, I would say, another character-defining feature of Utsun's uh, Sydney Opera House. Like is often the case with highly expressive, imaginative building forms like the Sydney Opera House, like the Bilbao Museum, which we'll look at here in a moment, um, it's common for the, when the architects are basically spending all of their creative and technical energy on solving the form or the shell, if you will, uh, they give themselves a better chance of success if the plan is highly pragmatic and simple. Otherwise, you're basically fighting a war on two fronts. Uh, and it, it's not that it's insurmountable, but it makes it really difficult. Um, and so you can see the, in my opinion, the very kind of orthogonal, very sensible floor plan with the exception of, you know, kind of the playfulness of the parallelogram um, shaping on the outside, uh, really where the, the, um, the theater seating uh, is occurring. It's actually a very rational uh, plan where you kind of enter through this large, pretty simple rectangular lobby. You have uh, kind of a central, main central axis. And then uh, you can, uh, as you go up to this level, you can kind of move off to the right, move off to the left, and then enter either of the two uh, gallery spaces. Uh, Centre Pompidou, 1977. 
Uh, this is in Paris, France. This is Richard Rogers and Renzo Piano. Richard Rogers is 1933 uh, to 2021. Renzo Piano was born 1937. Um, and this is a museum and exhibition hall where Piano and Rogers are basically doing something that I don't think anybody has ever thought to or anybody has ever executed before, which is that we're going to put the guts of the building on the outside. We're going to put the circulation system, the mechanical system, the plumbing system, the electrical system, uh, the uh, telecommunications. And we're going to basically put all of these systems, the things that are usually hidden and concealed on the inside that we fight so much in architecture to basically hide. We're going to celebrate them and put them on the outside. We're going to color code them so that you see that all circulation is red and all mechanical is blue and all waste is green, etc., etc. We're going to put these building systems on display and make them the facade and not worry about having a rusticated stone facade or a curtain wall glass facade. We're actually going to spend very little money on the facade because we're putting all the systems on the outside. Uh, these are the Gerberets that I was talking about, also one of your vocabulary terms. And what the Gerberets allow Piano and Rogers to do is where the free span would basically start here and, and well, I should say the free span would start here and end here using this kind of um, truss profile by attaching the Gerberets and, and extending out uh, the... Um, the place where the, the separation between tension and compression occurs, they're able to actually achieve a slightly longer free span area. So another kind of innovation of um, Rogers and Piano. And here's a really, really good sense of the kind of free span. There's the truss right there, or one of the many of the trusses uh, that they're able to achieve. They're able to achieve this span without a single thing because of A, the use of a of the truss and then be the addition even more centre pompidou okay we're on number 10 uh parc de la villette <clears throat> we talked about parc de la villette uh the essays a couple of you wrote about this which i appreciate there seems to be some confusion so i hope to clarify it here as i run through some of the character defining features of parc de la villette Parc de la Vallette is a competition that Bernard Schumi wins uh, and builds in 1977. Uh, it's in Paris, France. It's basically an existing park, but it's the introduction of a bunch of like small pavilions and buildings within this park to kind of rebrand and reintroduce the park to, uh, to the Parisians. Um, Bernard Schumi is born 1944. I'm sorry, I said 1977. He built it in 1987. So at Parc de la Villette, this is kind of the first postmodern, um, other than the houses we looked at in the uh, postmodernist lecture by Guathme and um, um, Charles Guathme did his parents' house and the Vanna, it's not coming to me. Venturi, sorry, um, Bob Venturi, um, postmodernist, one of the first postmodernist projects we looked at. Um, so there's the Venturi house, there's the Guathami house, which are good examples of postmodernism in residential. But as I said, for the final, we're only, we're focusing on non-residential buildings. So this is the first kind of postmodernist uh, non-residential building we've looked at and we're looking at, which is Parc de la Villette. So what Shumi does, character defining element of Parc de la Villette, he introduces and superimposes a grid system, a very regular and very structured grid system over the park. The grid system obviously creates these nodes or these points. The points are what give somebody the sense of um, regularity and rhythm and consistency 
to read all of the field condition together as one thing. They are what basically give you a sense of uh, place. You're within one zone. You're within one property. What he does is he basically throws in and mixes that up a little bit with this very sporadic placement of follies and elements. That's not, this is the competition um, graphic or the axonometric that he wins the competition with. He doesn't actually build this system of follies out. The slides and the photographs show you the follies that get, get built, but just kind of suffice it to say that the follies themselves have a very kind of... Uh, um, a chaotic uh, presence to them. And that's deliberate and that's intentional because what he's doing is he's basically providing these kind of moments of chaos in this otherwise very structured, regular, rhythmic uh, grid system. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, one of the uh, node points, another node point, another node point. They vary from one another and they're, some of them you can move in, some of them you can move under. Um, ultimately, all of them act together um, as one thing, which is the Parc de la Villette project. Uh, okay, the Louvre Museum, really the entrance to the Louvre Museum. The Louvre is the building that basically wraps the pyramid. Um, the Louvre Museum entry, as it's called, is completed in 1989. The, the museum itself is in Paris, France. I am Pay is the architect that wins the competition and gets to build the museum entry. Um, IMP lived 1917 to 2019. And he and the uh, competition basically asks architects to solve the problem of the entrance into the Louvre Museum, which tends to have a bottleneck. It has a non kind of a ceremonial um, uh, entrance um, underground to the building. And so what IMP comes up with is the idea to set in this open courtyard this very simple or uh, simple uh, geometric element uh, that is transparent, first of all, that allows you to actually to look past it at the traditional um, uh, architecture of the Louvre Museum, the original Louvre Museum, um, but also serves as a ceremonial, uh, very firm and permanent, you know, the pyramid is a very considered to be a very permanent, um, geometric form, if for no other reason than the fact that one of the most permanent things that's ever, that the earth has ever seen are the pyramids at Giza. Um, and so I am pay is giving this very permanent glass modern element, which is an entry, a marker for the museum, which brings people in and down to actually open up and allow them to kind of circulate or ambulate into any one of the multiple directions that they can kind of move around into the museum through. Also by having it be glass and transparent, uh, also diagrid, he's able to bring a lot of natural light in this otherwise dark and um, basement-like quality um, uh, space below the ground plane. Uh, okay, <clears throat> Vitra Museum. This is Zaha Hadid. She completes this in 1993. Zaha lived 20, 1950 to 2016. This is in Rhine, Germany. What Zaha is doing is actually something that Frank does with Guggenheim Bilbao a few years later which is that she's using the, um, the urban context, the urban conditions. The building is on, it's a fire station, first of all, um, and the building is on um, a corner where basically the roadway transitions from approaching directly uh, from, from ahead to winding around. And so what she's doing is she's basically taking the sort of what she reads as the kind of urban forces of the site as the site turns the corner and developing this kind of prow gesture that suggests that kind of there's this kinetic motion happening around the corner of the street. Her So this is a good example of it. Uh, as the roadway is kind of peeling through, the building itself is kind of doing the same thing. It's almost like a free body diagram of what the um, what the site condition is like if you were to read the forces of the site. 
Um, it's also, there's uh, um, sort of selective use of red fire stations. It's common to see the color red. How many fire stations have we seen where like the doors are painted red or the gates that the fire engines come out of are painted red uh, or that there's kind of a red accent. So there's actually a very traditional um, architectural move, I would say, with uh, putting some kind of red accent on the Vitra Museum uh, to basically sign, if nothing more, to us that this is a fire station. Uh, and the uh, the Architectural Daily Classic article, um, I think, has a third kind of very interesting character-defining element uh, that I hadn't read before and certainly haven't read Zaha describe it this way. Um, but it talks about how the building has this almost like embodied energy, this embodied kind of... Um, um, kinetic energy that it's just ready to kind of burst into action at any point like a fireman or a firewoman would be or is uh, because they're trained to basically be ready to respond on moment's notice. So the building kind of conveys that idea. I thought that was interesting. Okay, the Guggenheim Bilbao. Um, this is in Bilbao, Spain. Uh, this is by Frank Gehry, born 1929. Um, Frank Gehry is asked at Bilbao to do what Jorn Utzen was asked to do at Sydney, which is that give us architecture that puts the city of Bilbao on the map. So Gehry proceeds to design and build this amazing building that's, I would say, one of the most important buildings ever built. Um, again, you can actually see a lot of sort of rational plan principles, which... Um, make it a lot easier. Again, he's only fighting one battle, which is how to design and build this very expressive um, exterior. I don't want to call it only a skin system because it's not just a titanium skin, the titanium panels that are clad, but it's actually even figuring out the structural form of these kind of triple curving or these surfaces that are curving in, in three directions at any one given time. Uh, I think I have a good set. Oh, here we go. So there's, you know, you can, it, it, it's one thing to have kind of orthogonal, rational volumes and spaces. Um, and it's another thing to have kind of expressive facade, but the facade is actually also the structural system on this building. Uh, and so, you know, these kind of shapes and forms when you're working with steel framing, uh, is not easy to uh, to figure out. So it's more than just the skin because I would describe this surface as the skin, but it's actually the entire volume of the exterior uh, facade, which again has structural uh, performative aspects to it. So this is uh, the Richard Serra. I think it's part of the permanent collection, which is basically this very long linear gallery um, which does for Bilbao a lot of what uh, Khan was doing at Yale. So this kind of long, open, flexible space allows them to um, do a lot of different things with the um, uh, with the permanent collection in and around the collection. Uh, the entrance is here, and so you have you know the I think the building has twenty two or 23 different galleries. Go, You can go back and watch the lecture where I talk about this and get a little bit more in depth if you'd like. Um, oh, and I, uh, another thing that Gary talks about is that he's reading the site forces and that's what gives the building its kind of dynamic quality. Uh, the site happens to be at a convergence between a train line, there's the river, uh, there's the freeway and then there's the street grid system, all of which are kind of converging in this location. Um, and so this kind of amalgamation of forces is what, uh, to some degree, allows for this very dynamic, uh, formal quality that uh, Gary was able to design here. Uh, okay, the Reichstag, which is the dome, the reconstruction of the dome for German parliament. This is by Norman Foster. Norman Foster is born 1934. Uh, he completes the Reichstag dome in 1999. Uh, the Reichstag dome is demolished and torn apart and bombed um, in World War II. 
The Reichstag is the original seat of German parliament, even as far back as their first democratic republic. Uh, this is obviously before uh, Hitler and the Third Reich. Um, and so after the collapse of the Third Reich and the restoration of democracy in Germany, the German government envisions a project where the dome of the Reichstag is to be rebuilt. They announce a competition. Foster wins the competition by proposing a dome that is transparent, has a sustainable function that allows kind of air to be exhausted out uh, and fresh air to be uh, circulated into the building uh, for the parliament um, uh, that it sits atop. Um, third, allows public to actually occupy the dome, which is a little bit of an unheard of idea when the German government is thinking of this idea of rebuilding the dome of the Reichstag. I think what they're thinking is something that is respectful of what the original dome looked like. What Foster comes up with is what if we can rebuild the dome of the Reichstag, but what if people can actually go inside or into the dome of the Reichstag? And then fourth, by having a um, an opening on the inside of the occupiable portion of the terrace of the Reichstag dome, one is able to actually look down onto the proceedings, the live proceedings, daily proceedings of the German parliament, such as to convey this notion of transparency of government for not just the people of Germany, but anybody who chooses to visit and make their way up into this dome uh, and uh, and look down from the dome. You can actually see where the guardrail is and the glass railing. Uh, these people are actually looking down onto the parliament floor and the parliamentarians that are uh, creating the legislature and, uh, and uh, I suppose, protecting the rights of uh, the German people. Uh, Yokohama International Passenger Terminal. This is Foreign Office Architects. This is Farshid Musavi Mus Mus and uh, Alejandro Zerapolo. Um, they complete this project in two. Th I don't have their birth years because we're into kind of contemporary work. These are folks that would have been born in like the late sixties or maybe the early seventies. They are very active and practicing and teaching both today, uh, both fantastic architects. Um, they win a competition to do the, the, um, terminal here, which is, um, on the, uh, the port, not far from, uh, Jap Japan's main airport, Tokyo's main airport. Uh, and it's a multimodal ter terminal where there are ferries that take people to and fro. Uh, there's buses that stop here. There's pedestrian. Um, I don't believe the train comes into this terminal, but uh, again, multimodal transit center, which also has kind of free urban space for people to just kind of mosey in off the street here. Um, you know, what, whatever, enjoy their lunch break and actually, you know, head back to work a couple blocks away, but also serve the main function, which is the, uh, the train terminal function. This is really the further. So Yokohama terminal is the first use successful use of digital modeling technology for the purposes of fabrication and more specifically for the purposes of construction. What Zara Polo and Musavi talk about uh, and write about is that, um, yes, they produced the construction documents for this project. And yes, they produced some amazing construction documents and some just really um, uh, breathtaking, I would say, to look at uh, sections and details, which is what they had to do to have the building built. We build from plans, obviously, but also they talk about how the plans really didn't serve as much purpose during construction as the model that they had built um, had served. So I, I think that's an interesting thing because as they're using advanced technology to envision the forms and then to refine and to develop and then to document and draw and detail those forms, 
you know, digital technology is opening new frontiers. I find it really ironic and interesting that actually the builders themselves uh, said, okay, we get it. We see what you're trying to build. We want to actually go back in technology and, and better understand what you're doing by utilizing this model that you've built to help us understand how we're going to build this building. It's kind of like this pushing all the way, pushing the envelope as far as you can and then getting to the point of construction, assuming that the technology is going to continue to be utilized and our builders telling us, no, pull back and go back a few notches in terms of the technology. I think that's an interesting anecdote about Yokohama Terminal. The thing that I like a lot, and I haven't necessarily read this anywhere in terms of uh, what other people describe as a character defining feature, but the thing that's always fascinated me about Yokohama is the folding of surface. Um, there's a lot of kind of playfulness and liberties taken between um, uh, to really blur the line of what's a floor what's a wall, what's a roof, what's a ceiling. It's not clear. And I believe that Polo and Musavi are doing that intentionally uh, at the Yokohama uh, terminal. I want to go back to a prior. So this is a really, really good example of that. You know, what's wall, what's floor, what's ceiling, what's roof. Um, there's a kind of a blurring of those uh, surfaces into one another, which is accentuated even more, or I would say enhanced even more by wrapping the same material on all of those surfaces. Yokohama Terminal. Um, and last but definitely not least, the, oh, second to last, the Seattle Central Library. Uh, this is built in 2004. This is Rem Coolhouse, born 1944. This is in Seattle. Central Library, obviously the program is library. It's actually a lot more than library. It's more like what modern libraries are, which is way more than just a place, a repository for books. But there's uh, film spaces, there's music studios, there's um, uh, civic gathering spaces, um, there's performance spaces, there's all kinds of different uh, functionality here. It's very much a public building uh, in downtown Seattle. Some of the character defining features are that this is really one of the first projects which celebrate, I mean, all of these projects celebrate kind of different things. And that's one of the things that make them unique. But what OMA is doing at Seattle Public Library is they're basically taking the program of the building. They're organizing the program into these five parts and then basically stacking those five parts on top of one another and shifting slightly the programs in relation to one another, and then bridging basically vertically or diagonally, if you will, between those program blocks, and then saying, really, that's it. We've done the most creative thing that we want to do on this project is here in, the mo in what otherwise is considered the most boring um, topic of a building, which is the sort of very kind of analytical data entry quality that programming sometimes can take, they are saying, that's it, actually. That's the extent of the creativity. We're going to come up with this idea. And then at this point, we're just going to basically wrap a facade around the building. And that's what they um, describe as their process that led to this very interesting, what looks like kind of complex and um, I guess complex is just really a good way. So it's um, deceptively complex, I guess is what I should say, because um, the way they would describe it is it's highly pragmatic where they basically just wrap the skin or wrap the diagrid facade around that program diagram. But first look suggests to you that there's something much more sophisticated happening that inevitably led to this building form. Rem says that's not the case. And Joshua Prince Ramos, uh, architect with Rem on this building, says that's not the case. Um, so the diagrid, the diagrid obviously allows a lot, a huge amount of natural light to come into the building. Uh, the folding of the planes it makes a very interesting interior quality. Again, the fact that you're able to walk up and you have kind of the top side of the taper that's actually comprising um, 
So what you would be looking at is, imagine if we were on this floor looking down onto that surface, which is actually sloping towards us, but we're looking down onto it, makes for, I think, a very, very interesting and unique um, interior quality and certainly interior experience. Okay, and finally, the Oslo Opera House by uh, Snowheda. This was completed in 2007. Um, Snowheda is an architect that has many partners. Uh, started with five, uh, five partners. Uh, Craig Dykers is one of the partners whose names I know. I don't know um, all of them. And really all that matters is that you understand that Snowheda is the architecture firm that is associated with Oslo, uh, the Oslo Opera House, <clears throat> completed in 2007, 38,500 square feet, square meters, I should say, uh, $760 million project. They do 300 shows per year. They have ballet, they have opera, they have dance, they have concert. Snowheda uh, has done a couple of unique things with this project, not the least of which um, is the notion that um, the building as a result of its close proximity to the harbor, Snowetta is actually able to come up with the idea where what if we can develop a roof form that is sloped um, it, it, delicately enough to where pedestrians can actually walk on that slope surface? And what if that slope surface actually continued down past the ground plane of, of the building, pardon me, and actually allowed people to enter the harbor or the sea here? Uh, I believe that's the Baltic Sea um, that the building is basically um, set up against the coastline of. What if we can get people basically to the water as a result of the form of the building or the surfacing, the wrapping of the of the roof surface of the building? So they have uh, three things at the Oslo House. They call them the wave, the factory, and the carpet. The carpet is essentially the white surface that you're looking at, which is basically the path of travel around the building to the water, uh, the factory. And so they apply materials to kind of code to us, whether we're in the carpet, we're in the factory, or if we're in the wave wall. Um, and so the carpet is where the white stone is that we're seeing on the ground plane. The wave wall is all clad and coated with wood material, warm uh, wood material. Uh, and then the factory is all clad in metal. So the sort of service functional portions of the building are coated by having this kind of industrial metallic uh, coating um, on it. Uh, auditorium supports about 1,300 people. Uh, there's kind of a facade detail of the parapet. Um, so this is actually a good example of how the glass is supported by the structural columns of the building. A uh, good view of the wave wall, and then obviously we're looking through the glass curtain wall here to the outside. Uh, there's a view of the inside. It has a very similar quality to the uh, Sydney Opera House in that um, while we have metal, high incidence, high use of metal and stone, uh, industrial kind of cold material, heavy materials on the outside, that's contrasted or juxtaposed with this um, beautiful kind of wood-filled, warm uh, interior space as you move from the outside uh, to the inside. Reminds me, if I haven't already said this, uh, Stephen Hole, which we I don't think we've studied a Stephen Hole project in this course, but another uh, amazing um, architect that um, has done some incredible work in the past 20 years. Stephen Hull uh, has had a professor, I think he went to the University of Washington, where he uh, said he's never forgotten this idea that his professor had taught him, which is that a building should be more when you go into it than when you look at it. Um, again, a building should be more when you go into it than when you look at it. Um, and I think that's fascinating because really it's um, 
kind of a, a challenge uh, that I remind myself often, even in my own design work, which is that, you know, it's one thing to endeavor for the building to be interesting and to want to be looked at from the outside to have kind of an appealing or an interesting quality. Uh, I won't say beautiful or not, you know, usually um, architects, we, we consider the word beautiful kind of a bad word. We're not endeavoring to make something beautiful. I think more often than not, we're endeavoring to make something interesting uh, because what somebody considers beautiful, another person could consider to be ugly. Interesting is thought provoking. It gets your attention. It gets you to respond to it. It could be a negative uh, response. It could be a positive response, but I argue that really it's the buildings that don't evoke any sort of a reaction out of you. The mundane is really the bad architecture. The good architecture is the one that gets you to think whether positive or negative. So it's one thing to endeavor to create a building on the outside that is interesting. Certainly, you know, we're not going to look at this building and uh, forget about it or not notice it. This is a very unique building. Um, uh, all of these buildings we've looked at are very unique from the outside in terms of their form and their material presence and their street presence. No question. So it's one thing to endeavor to do something like that, to do the Sydney Opera House, to do the Oslo Opera House, to do the Guggenheim Museum, to do um, Ronchamp. It's one thing to endeavor to do those things. But what Hole's professor is telling him is do all of that, but also aspire to make the quality on the inside where really the human function takes place. Endeavor to make that even more than what the building is on the outside. So it ha you know, impress people even more with when they move into the building than when they're looking at the building on the outside. Because ultimately, what are our buildings if they are not uplifting and they are not providing uh, an interesting experience, especially when we're talking about some of our civic architecture and our public architecture? interest people from the outside, but inspire them as they move in inside of your of the building. I think the Oslo Opera House does that really well, as do every one of the projects that we've looked at today uh, and really throughout the course of the semester. Um, that's all I have for final review. I'm sorry this went a little bit long, an hour and 40 minutes, but hopefully this will be really the only thing other than maybe 20 or 30 minutes of additional research on um, some of these buildings just to have your notes prepared. Uh, so hopefully this helps. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest. It really has been my honor to teach you this class this semester. Um, I look forward to uh, reading your final essays, um, and I look forward to hearing from you all as you continue your careers in education uh, and professionally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.